how many of you love during the summertime to cannonball and yell it as loud as you can as you jump in the pool? Nobody? I already thought it's wow. Okay. Well, we are going to be literally splashing into a one week series just today, a one week um, topic on an elevated conversation about politics. So how many of you during um, the time where we're ready to vote and you see all the signs out on the people's lawns, do you ask your mom and dad who they're voting for? Anybody else ask? No? Um, sometimes you might hear from your parents that they're voting for one person or another. How many do you hear that in your family as they go about their week? Like they already know who they plan to vote for. Okay? How many of you don't hear much of anything as far as politics in your house? Okay? All right. So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about this. And as we talk about it, we, I want you to think about uh, how it relates to you and in your life. So in this particular idea, I know that in my family, when we come to a Thanksgiving dinner, we have my brother and his girlfriend, and then we have my sister and her family, and her husband is from Honduras, and then we have their kids as well as um, my uncle usually joins us for Thanksgiving dinner. And all of us have a different opinion about politics, whether it's one topic or another. And so um, there's so many things that come into politics that can divide a family. And so when we talk about politics, we often see so much division, like literally, if you um, bring up politics at most Thanksgiving or Christmas get-togethers, it's probably the quickest way to end the day. Like that's how aggressive people can get with it. And so um, more than almost any other topic, politics creates judgments. We build judgments about who people are simply by how and for whom they cast their vote. That's why politics have become like a taboo subject because they create so much tension. Now, tension exists in our society all the time, like hot dogs or hamburgers, Minecraft or Fortnite, Marvel or DC Comics. And so all of these things can cause division with people. But politically, political tension is a different category altogether. Rather than just being a simple disagreement, the tension about politics often grows like an overfilled water balloon into something negative towards the other side or towards the other person and towards creating hostility between two people or groups. We choose dividing political sides on things like who should be president and issues like immigration, equality, the economy, and other issues so divisive that merely mentioning them would cause emotions to rise, and maybe even in you. Now, it's no secret that political tension divides all types of people. It can drive a wedge between family members, the best friends, or even people of the same faith. And we've all seen how wild it can get when people bring politics up at those family meals. Now, let's be clear. The fact that we, can, we have the right to vote for a candidate and policies is an incredible privilege. The truth is that there are populations of our society at one time who 
were not afforded the right to vote. So since the right to vote costs so much and is such an honor, tension and debate around politics creates passions that are fueling the topic. And that's actually understandable. But it also seems like a game that nobody can win. So how do we approach a conversation about politics and policies in the wisest way? It all comes down to a choice. So will I choose a position regarding an issue over a person on the other side? And when you are a Jesus follower, that choice becomes even more important. Jesus himself lived in the tension of policy and politics, placed between the oppression of the Roman Empire on one side and the religious power of the Jewish temple on the other side. Jesus navigated life alongside people who rarely lived in total agreement. He addressed how to live well in this ideological hurricane that politics can create. In Matthew 5, 41, during Jesus's message on how to live in the best life, Jesus says this, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Now, this might not sound like anything big for us, but this was huge for the people who were listening to Jesus. He was addressing how to deal with political tension. The Jews knew that listening to Jesus, he was addressing a Roman policy declaring that any Roman soldier at any time could demand and force a Jew to carry his gear for him for one mile. And the average weight of a Roman pack was between 80 and 100 pounds. And he could just, you carry this for me and you would have no argument. So that created anger in the Jewish people. And so Jesus saying this was like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't want to carry it one mile, let alone two. He felt that tension. He knew that this was a hard thing for the people to hear. I can't imagine how it felt physically and emotionally to be required to carry a Roman soldier's gear. And Jesus cuts right to it through the political policies to teach his followers that you should show compassion to those who oppose you and to love your enemies. Through every example of Jesus' life and his ministry, we find a constant thread. Jesus always chose to value the people over the policy. Mark captured another uh, notable example of this where Jesus places the dignity, value, and well-being of people over and above rules and policy. A group of people were arguing about the harvesting grain on the Sabbath, which was a commanded day of rest according to the Jewish law. Some religious leaders were accusing Jesus' disciple of breaking the rules when Jesus did this. So on this particular Sabbath day, the disciples were hungry, and they didn't even think about it because at the edges of people's farms where they could grow wheat and grain, it was left for those who were hungry and poor. And so they would pick that off. And this particular day, the disciples picked a couple grains and rubbed it in their hands and ate it. And they were like, your disciples, they're breaking the law. Aren't you going to correct them? It's the Sabbath day. Don't you know that you're not supposed to do that? They accused them of harvesting grain on this particular day. And this is what Jesus says to them. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. 
the religious leaders were so caught up in the rules and missed the purpose of the rules and why they existed to begin with, to help people. For Jesus, it's people over everything. More important than a policy, a party, a side, or a stance, Jesus constantly chose to value people first. From his enemies to his followers, it was always people. And where we really see Jesus lead the way is how he interacted with those who were oppressed by society or circumstances. In John 8, 1 through 11, we see a story of a woman who was caught in adultery. As a result, the law had demanded that she be publicly humiliated, dragged out of the bed that she was in, and then shamed and humiliated and executed. But Jesus sends the crowd away by choosing to show grace and love to the dignity and humanity of this woman who was obviously exposed and guilty. Jesus then helps her to her feet and says, go and sin no more. And thankfully, Jesus is the same with us. Every time we're guilty in our sin, he continues to give us grace and chooses us. Now, I want you to think about the many others who were also part of the outcasts, tax collectors that Jesus received and had dinner with, people who were spat on for doing what they did. They were said to have sided with the Romans rather than their own people. They would often rob their own people. And just Jesus still treated them as people. There are those who were lame and blind, who were cast aside and put on a gate to make sure that they could panhandle for enough cash to be able to get enough food for that day. And yet Jesus approached them often and healed them. What about the leper who was actually forced out of civilization to live in a cave or a place far away because their disease was so contagious they would burn the clothes that they were wearing if they came anywhere near it. They weren't allowed to come within so many feet of people and they approached Jesus and they may not have been touched in years and years and years because of their contagious disease. And when Jesus saw them, he touched the lepers. He first touched them and let them know that they were loved and that they were cherished by him and that he would heal them. And thankfully, like I said, Jesus does the same for us. It says in Romans 5.10, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. The entire Bible is one big story of God loving, choosing, and rescuing people. And that was Jesus showed up time and time again when argumentative religious leaders demanded Jesus take a side Jesus chose to love people more than policy. When you look at Jesus, this becomes abundantly clear. The way of Jesus means that people are more important than policy. Which leaves us with a big question. How do you and I follow Jesus and navigate political tension? Perhaps the best place to start is by asking yourself a few questions. Do you see the person on the other side of your view as sacred? Do you see that person as an image bearer of God with worth and dignity? Do you view that person with reverence and treat them with incredible respect and care? Do you do all of this regardless of their political persuasion? 
party or stance. <clears throat> we could look at people and colors. We could. But God shows us a different way. So God created mankind in his own image. The image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And that's from Genesis 1.27. Remember that God always chose people above everything else. Above all the decisions that came his way, the things that he could have chose, and he didn't. It was always people. Can I pray for us as we try to represent God and the uh, and the love and image of God with other people? Sometimes we disagree with people, and it's okay to disagree with people and not treat them like they're less than. Let's pray about that. Father God, we thank you so much that we can be friends with people who we may disagree with. Lord, I thank you that we could come to different decisions and opinions and thoughts and not be so focused on being right that we forget that we are in relationship with people. Lord, you chose uh, a path that created peace and not division. You loved people more than policy. You loved people more than trying to take a side or two. And I thank you, Lord, that you are gracious to us, that in the same way we might be able to see people as in your image, that we would treat them with love and respect and care. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you really liked it, hit subscribe below. And if you wanna check out some other videos that we have on our channel, click right over here. And if this video up here is one that's specifically picked out for you. Thank you again for watching.